Let's turn this thing on for the first time and see what happens. Yeah, that's pretty freaking cool. Especially here, like it looks totally like it's welding the material. So the fine folks at Creality have sent me this laser cutter, uh, Creality Falcon 2, and I have no idea what's in there, so find out what that is. And uh, yeah, let me cut this thing open and see what's inside. All right, so from my understanding, it's mostly assembled. Look at that, little tiny e-stop button. Cool. Let's see here. So this is instructions how to do it. Oh, look at that. Some uh, some logic of. No, it's upside down. So working from a flashcard. From a PC, probably the PC. I guess I don't know. There's a laser head. And there's a wire on it. Oh, that's not the laser. That's the that's a pump. Okay, never mind. Screwed that one up. This looks like the some samples of stuff, some felt, and it's like a piece of stainless steel or something. Maybe some wood in there too. Yeah, let me get this whole thing out of the box and have a better look at it. Oh, that's cool. This whole box is an enclosure, so it's like a little tent. Originally, I was thinking, take this whole enclosure here and hook up a bathroom fan to it and some some pipe and stuff, just and then just put the whole thing into the the CNC machine. That way, I don't have to breathe all the smoke and stuff. But looks like I don't have to do that. I could just have it on this desk. I'm not sure if the Falcon 2 comes with this by default, but if it doesn't, I would highly suggest getting this, especially. Uh, if you don't have like access to a garage because you really don't want to be uh, breathing all this stuff like if you're cutting felt and and wooden stuff yeah some metal some plastic you know all the all that fumes all the oxides and stuff you really want to be working in like a enclosed setup like this look at that it's got a little rotary table cool because if you want to uh add yeah, just like little bottles or something i'm not sure I don't even know how that would work because like this thing's so high up if you're laser cutting or etching you know something like stainless steel like you don't want to zap yourself in the eyes everything's really high up where's the where's the business end of this thing there it is so there's a wavelength 455 24 volts 22 watts. So I presume, uh, I think what I read was it has four laser diodes in it. They're like in a, like an array with a bunch of mirrors in there and they're just adding together. And then they come at the bottom there. One thing I don't get is, uh, so the clear plastic you see here, let me just open this thing up so we can have a better look at it. So the main window on this uh, laser, which is uh, orange, and wavelength of 455. It's orange. The lenses that come, where the protective glasses, are green. So I don't really know what's going on with that. Plus, these don't have any ratings of uh, what they can, what they're safe for. Now, I got uh, these ones when I was doing the uh, laser level uh, webcam thing, just so I couldn't wouldn't be zapping myself. And that's what they look like over here. And these ones have a rating, so 190 to 555, and then also 800 to 1100 nanometers. And I presume this is the infrared, because I don't know if I trust wearing these things, because you know you only have two pairs of eyes and you don't get any extras. So let me know what you think. Like, I think I'm going to be using these to run this thing, just because like these have no rating and like they're the wrong color. So you know what what's up with that? I keep on finding more stuff in the box, so here's a stainless steel kind of waffle kind of diffuser kind of thing. That's really cool. And looks like there's yeah a piece of stainless steel on the bottom. I presume that goes under this. It's not the same size as the work area, so like it's a little bit smaller. But you know, I guess you can move it around and stuff. From the build quality of this thing, I'm really impressed. Like literally everything is custom made. Like this extrusion here. Like that's right in, uh, that's designed into that extrusion right there. Over here, 
So like this entire extrusion, whoop, dropping the wood. Let move this wood out of the way. Over here, like this, uh, this tube on like you know, on this side, it's nothing. But internally, like it has another uh, ledge in there for uh, whatever kind of rails or whatever it's running on. Like it's built into it, and it's you know that's really slick. What is this? The, the y-axis over here. There's a stepper, and yeah, they're not using two of them like I would have thought. It's a single stepper, and the ax the axle is going right through it, and it's doing you know doing it that way. Pretty cool. There is also min and max limit switches, so you can see here as this goes over, and then there's another one over here. So like on my CNC machine over here, I'm only having uh, minimum limit switches here because like like I can't manually like once this thing's running I can't. There's no way I can move this thing around. And I presume the reason why you get min and max on this side is like I, you can easily move these axes around when you're, you know, I guess maybe if you're manually positioning it. And if I move this over, you'll be able to hear it click. So no chance of crashing this thing. Not like you're gonna crash it hard at all, but yeah, that way you don't damage anything uh, while it's running with the min and max switches. Flipping it over on the bottom, here's where the lights can go in. You got a whole bunch of different positions you can go with. And here's the legs. They are aluminum extruded. And they, you know, it's the uh, same quality as the rest of the machine. Everything's like real slick. Comes with a whole bunch of spacers. I presume this is for, uh, yeah, so you can, you can really bring the height up. I presume when you're, you know, you're using this thing, you want you need to raise the whole thing up. So that's probably the reason for that. The uh, pump that this comes with, this looks like more of a off-the-shelf thing and not, you know, designed with the the rest of the machine in mind, because this is, you know, a different color and a bit more plastic and stuff. The machine, the machine itself has like no plastic on it, like things like, you know. You could have thought that they could have probably just put some, you know, plastic feet on this, but no, they're just, it's aluminum. And what's really cool is, so you got a pump and the laser here, this has the uh, location for the pump and it's all integrated. So it's not like you're having to attach something to the side of it where it's spraying in. All totally integrated. And yeah, that's going to come out the bottom there. What I assume the point of the uh, air pump is with this is, I guess it's twofold. So you're going to keep the optics clean, so you're less likely to get smoke onto the uh, lens in there. And then, you know, if you do that, you're going to have problems where that could heat up and stuff. And also, you don't have all the smoke uh, diffusing the laser beam as it's going down and hitting the, the workpiece that you're doing. So everything, you know, probably gives you sharper cuts. Mind you, like, I, I've never used one of these things, so... You know, that could be totally wrong. I dropped the keys of the Falcon 2 on the ground and found this uh, chunk of little carbide. Let's turn this thing on for the first time and see what happens. I'm gonna be wearing these ones, these are my own. You got some keys. This is really good, cause like if you have small children, like they like to come in and touch and mess with stuff. Like I certainly would if I was like 10 years old. So like that's, that's a good thing to have. So I put that on the on and I have this engaged. So yeah, pop that off. And turn the button and see what happens. Sounds like the fan going over there. Yeah, so when you turn this thing on, let me turn it off. Just turning this thing on, it's you're gonna get the pump going and there's also a fan on the laser. So that thing's gonna go. So the way you uh, set the height of this thing is with this piece of uh, aluminum here and you can see here it's got the different depths so depending on what you're cutting and the way you do that is two little knobs and I'll just put on the top one there tighten it up pretty easy and it looks like the uh, X carriage has a bit of play in there in this pivot so I'll probably uh, open that up and look at it, see if I can tighten it. Some of these bolts are probably loose. But yeah, if I turn this uh, K 
camera so you can see the side of it. So I presume it's, you know, that's, let's see. Yeah, I'm really not gonna be able to see at this camera angle. But yeah, there's like, I don't know, maybe two degrees, one degree or so of motion in there. Uh, probably just needs to be tightened up a bit. The frame on this thing is surprisingly rigid, like, like it doesn't flex at all. I can flex the uh, squareness of this thing. I'll show you what that looks like, how much it can move. Like you can move it a bit, but like keep in mind, this is like a laser engraver cutter. Like there's no tool, there's no cutting pressure on the head, so it doesn't really matter. What's, uh, what could be really cool is, so like you saw the legs, how they go in. What you could do, like if you're a DIYer, like you can get some plywood and cut out a base for this thing and, uh, and bolt that whole thing together. And then that way you could also have the honeycomb grid attached securely and some also like, you know, some like fixture points. Cause like the way I'm seeing it right now is like you have the machine and you have everything floating, uh, like your work, like what you're gonna put on. Like this piece of stainless steel I grabbed. Like if I'm gonna etch that, like I have no way of knowing the alignment of this thing to the machine. But what I would do is like, if you're doing this, build a base for this thing. And then that way you can, you can get the alignment of everything perfectly. And that'll save you a lot of trouble with trying to just like, you know, if you're putting some lettering on something and like, it's just not the right angle, that could surely help. This machine does have a lot of warning labels and like, it's necessary. Like this is a class four laser and that's no joke. Like, especially 22 Watts. Like even if you get hit by, you know, a scattered beam off this thing, you know, you could be looking at multiple Watts of power going right into your eyes and like that will destroy your eyes and like definitely wear protection. I'm really surprised that this machine doesn't have an LCD panel because you're like, you can't really, you can't really use this machine uh, from an SD card because like you, it's only going to print the first thing and like, you're not going to be able to go through, um, you know, a menu and pick like, you know, from, from some things that you have saved on it. Um, so you're really like, you really got to be having this whole machine tethered to a PC. Crowley makes tons of 3D printers, like the Ender 3, Ender 5. I'm not sure why they didn't put an LCD on there. Like, it's really strange. They, they do have all these uh, 3D printers. So some of that hardware could have been used on the setup. It seems like an annoyance because you, you have to have a PC if you want to use this thing realistically. You're only going to be able to print from the, the last thing that you put in that SD card. So some of the safety features I've seen on this, uh, you got your keys, you got your e-stop. Um, there is some sensors in the head, like there is a, so like the one in the middle here, fire. Um, I don't think that's activated, but like there is a, a smoke or a fire detector in there. I'm gonna build this enclosure off camera while my uh, cell phone charges and uh, I'll be back with this thing assembled. When I was taking everything out of this box, I was like getting kind of worried because I was like, where's the fan of this thing? Cause I'm like, expecting like some giant, like uh, mains voltage AC blower. But no, you just need like a little fan like this. So this is even USB, like five volts. So that's all you really need, I guess. The, uh, the frame of this, this is not plastic. This is something else. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't know what you, uh, Somebody that uh, camps a lot probably knows what this is, but it's like, it's very rigid. Yeah, like, I don't think you're gonna snap any of these things very easily, like, they're quite rigid. As you can see the enclosure, there is some assembly required to put this thing together, unlike the laser cutter. The laser cutter itself, like, it's literally assembled already. Like, all you have to do is plug in some cables and attach to the head, and like, it's finished. Just a heads up, don't do what I was starting to do with you know, taking all these out because they don't have any labels of, you know, which size there are and there's a whole bunch of lengths for this thing. So look at that. So save yourself some headaches and keep in the plastic where the numbers are. That way you know like when you're building this frame you know which one to grab. I know some unfortunate soul is going to take the packaging now for all these and not know the sizes anymore and in the instructions they don't tell you the lengths of anything. 
So here you go. Here's the lengths for all the tubes and numbers. Just another note, when looking at this, so two, both of these are two. And then up here where it's number six, both of those are six. So when you're, when you're looking at all this, it's the same on both sides. So like one, for instance, the length one is, you know, on that side as well. And then obviously that's a mirrored side of that side. So that's the size relation between the frame and the machine. And this is going to have a uh, window and what do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be green like the glasses or orange? I don't know. I haven't even checked actually. Yeah, it's orange. That's what it looks like on the inside. Pretty cool. So it's on the top too, so let's crap it up. This thing is too big to fit on the camera, so here we just Yeah, so looks like what you get is the uh, the uh, top, so on the top of the enclosure and on the uh, sides and stuff, you can look down. It's not completely transparent where you uh, put the fan. I'm going to put the fan and everything on the outside and then the uh, fan shroud. I think that's what you call this. I'm going to have this on the inside. That way there's no like interference where like the fan is hitting the machine. And uh, I'm going to put some Loctite on these bolts. Some Loctite. I'm going to put them on these little, these ones here. That way, like, these things just don't come loose over time, because I'm pretty sure they will. Uh, Loctite, you really don't want to get this stuff on your hands, so read the hazard warnings. So I'm going to wear this glove. I started with the, the bolts on the outside and then the nuts on the inside, but I'm going to flip that around because the uh, bolts are kind of long, and this way, going the other direction, they're not going to scratch up the machine. It's the next day. I'm super happy with how this uh, enclosure turned out. It like it's fully sealed on the bottom. Uh, it went together nice and tight, and it's yeah. Like you got this tube here. It's not very long though, so you're gonna have to be. It's up to you what you're gonna do with this. Quality of this is pretty good, but ultimately, you're gonna have to do a trip to Home Depot and figure out like if you're gonna run a, a longer one or go through a filter or something. I'd suggest just getting a long one and then venting the exhaust from this thing outside. That way you don't have to. You know, you're not breathing any of the uh, stuff from the inside of this. So it has two zippers. Let me show you what that looks like when it's open. It goes all the way to the back, but I'll just do the halfway. So that's how that looks. You get a little bit of space around all sides. So it's not too tight. There's a little fan in the back. It's a USB 5 volts. Uh, as far as I can tell, I don't see any way uh, anywhere you can plug it in. So I'm just running it on a wall plug over here and just this one right there. Let me show you what that looks like. So you can hear it. It's pulling enough air to, to work I think. And when this whole thing is sealed like it's gonna produce negative air pressure so any of the gaps that you have on the bottom, that shouldn't be a problem at all. The top window part is the same color, obviously, as the uh, orange down there on the laser. And from what I can tell, like when you have this thing fully sealed, you're you're pretty much safe from like any stray light beams. It's kind of like the CO2 laser uh, enclosures where everything's contained and pretty safe. And that's one thing that a lot of diode laser cutters, from what I've seen, are kind of lacking is safety features like that. So this whole enclosure really helps in that circumstance. These uh, poles up here, I think they might be fiberglass. I'm not sure. But the uh, connector here in the middle, because it's two lengths, one there and one there, uh, that's like a plastic ABS or something. And I, I bet over time, like you're, you're using this thing a lot, you might lean on this thing. You might, you might bend these things or break them or something. So you might have to 3D print new ones. I don't think they could have put in a long one just because of the size of the box. They would have had to double the the length of the box, so it makes sense. But other than that, like I don't see any problems with this uh, enclosure. Like, you know, I think it is going to do the job perfectly. I got the pump out here on the back side just so it's getting cleaner, and I'm just running it in through uh, the other side where you could add the exhaust vent. On this side, you got a little pocket so you could put like you know these kind of things in there, or flashcards or 
whatever you want. My biggest concern with uh, getting a laser cutter was safety and because like I have a five-year-old and I have a two-month-year-old you can probably hear him screaming in the background sometimes and uh, yeah just having something safe like uh, an enclosure like this really helps out with that. Here's a rotary table accessory and from what I can tell it's really well built like it's pretty solid and the only connection on it is over here so this is just to the stepper motor and from looking at the instructions, use the instructions for it. Uh, what you do is you replace the Y-axis gantry. So you unplug that and then you plug this one in and then you do a bunch of other things. You probably have to do some things in software as well. And yeah, it's basically like a rock tumbler. And I bet, I bet when you're not using it and you buy peanut butter, you know that healthy peanut butter that you know comes out of solution, you could probably stick a, a jar on there and give it like 30 minutes and have nice peanut butter too. Here's a closer up of the internals of it. So just a pulley and then like there's it's all pretty solid and then there's a bunch of adjuster screws. It comes with uh, these little rollers so these would go on here and then that way if you're doing anything that has like a small neck on the bottle you can align everything and get it so it'll still rotate. I was planning on making something cool with this thing, but there's really a lot to go over. So I'll probably split it up into multiple videos and have a second video where I'm actually making something interesting on it. But yeah, this is really just kind of a first impression looking and going over a lot of the stuff. I'm gonna jump into the software side and see if I can get this thing running and um, maybe break out some of that sample material. I have some other materials here. Like I know the uh, in the sample box, it comes with a piece of steel. I'm not sure what it is, but I have some Oh, dropping stuff. I have some 304 stainless steel here. These diode lasers, they're not really designed for touching any of this stuff. Like if, you, if you're if you interested in that stuff, you're gonna wanna look at a fiber laser. They cost considerably more money though, so. But yeah, regardless, it'd be interesting to see if it does anything to this material. Even try, it might even try painting some of it and seeing if it'll, you know, if it'll burn through the paint, heat up, and you know, cause something on the surface of it. I went out and got some plywood. I think this is birch plywood. And let me see if I can get the thickness. So I have the thicker one. This is 11 and a half millimeters. And then the thinner one, it's uh, just under six millimeters. So I'm gonna try it out on this stuff because this is kind of more realistic to like what I would be wanting to cut on one of these diode lasers. So we'll try that. Uh, that's probably gonna be in a second video though. On the software side, you got two options. You got SD card and uh, PC direct. I'm not even gonna cover the SD card because like the machine doesn't have an LCD screen on it. So it's not like you can pick and choose which of the uh, G code files you're gonna run on the machine. So um, yeah, so I, I'm just gonna go with PC. So I'm researching online. Everybody talks about how uh, laser gerbil is not that great compared to light burn, but I'm gonna give Larry Sewer gerbil a try and see what it looks like. Like in the end, what are you really doing? You're just, you're taking in vector files and you're, you're either etching on the surface or you're cutting right through. Like this, like laser gerbil has probably got to be able to handle that. Um, if I run into problems, I'll, I'll buy and install a light burn and run that. Direct from the manual, here's some parameters or specs of the machine. So you can pause the video and check that out. Some of the other stuff, like you got to do firmware upgrade and stuff. I'm not going to cover that. Like if you buy the machine, you can you can figure out a lot of that stuff yourself. In the instructions, uh, they go over. It looks like setting up on the basswood, so I'm going to run that through the machine first because they give you a bunch of little pieces of that. So that'll be a good uh, sort of test. Uh, make sure that the machine works. Okay, so I'll check it out. I've gone into Gerbil, Gerbil configuration, and if you scroll down here, you'll see. Maximum XY travel. So I've set it to 350, 350. That is smaller than the size of the machine. And I've written that to the firmware. And if I run this and home it, so if I go homing, you'll see it's gonna home. But regardless of that, I can still crash the machine. So by, I have it moving uh, 20, no 50 millimeters. So I'm gonna, gonna just jog it to the maximum on the X and you can see here I'm at 350 there I'm already past that I'm at like uh, 400 right now 
So at least I'm finding uh, specifying the maximum travel in laser gerbil, it's not respecting that. And I have been able to crash the, the uh, laser module into the sides by uh, reaching like the maximum limits. And yeah, it shouldn't be doing that. So, so, that's, so that's not really reassuring for laser gerbil. So I might uh, grab light burn and uh, just run it on this. As you can see, I was able to crash the machine. I was able to, uh, after it's been homed, I was able to go past its limits and then crash into the limit switch on the opposite side. Um, this one was a little more rough than the, the one on the back. Um, this is uh, through no fault of chirality. Um This is uh, because of laser gerbil. Um, laser gerbil team, if, if, uh, if I've done something wrong, let me know in the comments because uh, it would be nice to have this machine working with that. But like fundamentally, a uh, machine, you know, this is a small machine. So like, it's not like you're gonna do any damage. But let's say for instance, if this was a laser cutter, um, like these have 400 watt AC servos. If I went past the limits and crashed into the end and, and trashed a thousand dollar ball screw, I'd be really pissed. So I think what I'm gonna do is buy and install Lightburn and run the tool through that from now on. I did have the max limit set and I believe the step size on the steppers was correct. And in the software in the top right corner, it does say what your coordinates are. And I was able to pass 350 on both axes. So doing a bit more research, I found that uh, in order to get the travel to work correctly, you have to enable soft limits and I've done that. And unfortunately now I'm running into travel exceeded errors. So at this point, I'm gonna try uh, light burn out and have a go at that. All right, so I got light burn going and gonna do a material test and I'm gonna use it on some of this basswood. And uh, yeah, I was looking at the, uh, let me see if I can load them up. The recommended parameters. And for basswood, two millimeters thick, if we're gonna engrave 30% power, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Probably uh, light the garage on fire, but that'll be interesting. All right, so I got the door open so we can see what's going on, or else uh, it won't show up on video through the orange screen. <coughs> this is the framing, so this is what it's gonna cut out. Unfortunately, I can't see, like, uh, I think there's a setting in Lightburn, or maybe the firmware, so the uh, when you're framing, you'll see like a 3% powered laser. So I gotta figure out how to do that because that would be good to you know, do way easier to frame. And what I've done is I've put this in the corner and uh, jogged the uh, head over here and then just aligned it manually this way. So it should be, shouldn't be rotated much at all. All right, here goes nothing. Alright, I'm gonna cancel it. Looks like it's not powered enough. Alright, I bumped up the text from 20% to 50%. So, see what happens.
Yeah, that's pretty cool. What to do to the other side? Yeah, that cut all the way through on almost on that one. So I picked a uh, 416. This maxes out the uh, speed of the machine. Fortunately, I only went up to 60%. So at uh, this speed, at this speed, uh, yeah, it's not really doing much of anything. Maybe if I add it, yeah, maybe if I added that, that and then cranked it to 100%. It would do something to this basswood. All right, so this test was pretty cool, but I should have done a fill instead of a cut because I was trying to do engraving. That's why I only did the last one. Um, but I'm really interested in stainless steel because these things can apparently touch stainless steel. So this is a chunk of something, 16 gauge maybe, maybe 14 gauge of stainless steel, I think. I don't know what grade. Um, I'm gonna look up the settings for this and uh, yeah, just do a chart like this. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit smaller. I'll have to see if I can, you know, fit it with this. And, uh, yeah, fill in and uh, see what it does. Apparently, it'll cut, uh, it'll do color. So, like, depending on the uh, power, it'll it'll change its color. So, that'll kind of be interesting to see. I got my fingerprints all over this, so I'm going to clean this off with some acetone. That way, none of the smudges and stuff are going to affect anything. There, that's how it looks all cleaned off. All right, stainless steel, here we go. I really hope my camera survives this. This is so hot, it's probably gonna warp the stainless steel. It's probably gonna like buckle up or something. I don't have it down, it's just kinda floating there. It's just, yeah. It is really thick though. It's like probably 14 gauges, 16 gauge or so. So maybe it'll be all right. Here's the results with the stainless steel. Pretty freaking cool. When I was doing it, I didn't reset the height of the laser. So it was still on the basswood and the basswood is thicker. So yeah, it's possible that the the uh, lines could have been sharper, but like even, even there, like those are really sharp. Obviously the lettering, I went, the lettering I went uh, 5%. Um, five percent, uh, no, five millimeters a second at a hundred percent. So they're just burned in there really good. I'll have to take this with, uh, clean it with some acetone and see if it, like, still retains this color. These ones up here, like, they, has, they got some nice color going on. Yeah, and as you can see from when I rotate it, like, all that heat totally just distorts this piece of stainless steel. Especially from this angle, like, look at that. So I could see, like, this method being pretty good on uh, like using it sparingly on on uh, like if you're etching stainless steel, but yeah, you gotta keep in mind you're gonna you're gonna warp the hell out of whatever you're doing it on. So like yeah, like I wouldn't put this much. And this is like this is a pretty thick piece of stainless steel too. Like if I were to take uh, something like this, this is 18 gauge 304, and I don't know what this is, but the you can see from this angle, it's considerably thicker. Okay, time to clean it with some acetone. So that's before. Yeah, stuff's coming off. It's probably these really thick letters up here and on the side. There it is. That's pretty freaking cool.
Yeah, so I don't know, like maybe maybe if you're doing stuff with stainless steel and you want to etch it, maybe you don't need a fiber laser. Maybe maybe something like this. This is the Creality Falcon 2, 22 watts. Seems like it's getting the job done to me. It's slow though, but it doesn't cost $5,000. This took me at least a half an hour, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah, but like... This you get like a big build volume. This is roughly 400 millimeters square that you can get with like a fiber Galwa laser. You're kind of limited to like, you know, half that unless you put on a big giant uh, CNC machine gantry. But yeah, I'm pretty impressed with this. Let's see if I can see how much we can focus. Like the colors are definitely coming off, showing off on the camera. Down here, it's just kind of burned, burned totally, and then up here, yeah, maybe doing a test with uh, some faster uh, speeds, less temperature, maybe didn't go down to like 40%, and then just see, maybe even 30%, just see how it trails off, see what kind of colors you get up here. But yeah, this certainly is taking care of the spectrum on this end. Like, it's definitely etched in the surface. Here's a piece of brass. I don't want to use anything uh, tougher and scratch it, but we should be able to pick up the uh, sound on the camera. So this one down here. Yeah, that's totally that's totally in that surface. This is nothing, and then yeah, you can't. At this top corner, you can't really uh, can't really feel anything. This one's got some funky stuff happening on it. But yeah, down here, like this is totally like I can I can feel that. I might uh, get my microscope out and have a look at this stuff really close, see what it actually looks like, see how much, like, see what the power is doing down there. See how that's etched in. Up close on the higher power ones, you can totally see how it's just like ablating and digging in that surface quite a lot. Yeah, these letters were way too powered. Like, I was using 100% at 5 millimeters those letters and like they're totally just burned in what's interesting i find is on the higher power ones where i'm running it at like a hundred percent and like five millimeters uh, those ones it looks really dark in person when you look at it but under the microscope it looks like it's very shiny and like maybe what's going on like on the 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 hills are very shiny but like the valleys look like they have a lot of oxide in them and then maybe maybe the way the the light is just diffusing off of it where it's not reflected you know um, perfectly and it's it's diffusing the light off maybe that's what's giving it that darker look and but definitely uh, when you when I'm showing the difference between different power ranges you can tell that you get those colors based on the oxides and the oxides look like they're they're in the valleys of the welds from the laser beam. Like what the laser is doing is actually, especially here, like it looks totally like it's welding the material. I'm not sure what's in stainless steel that is allowing the uh, 455 nanometer beam to, to do this. Some of these shots you can see like what looks to be somewhat like a PWM in it, like especially when you zoom in. Uh, all the tracks and it looks like constant uh, distance between all the ripples pretty interesting stuff I bet you could like take this thing and like weld two razor blades together I wonder what the results would look like if you ran this thing in a, an argon chamber like what would what would the laser beam do like if you if you sprayed on an argon beam some of them like uh, like this one here it gives you nice the, like the lines are very sharp not sharp. Uh, the the lines are like some of the lines, uh, horizontal lines. They're very very straight. While in other ones, 
the lines are kind of waving and stuff. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Like I didn't shake or didn't do anything with the table. You can definitely see that it looks like there's stacks of dimes happening when it's running. And it's like those those little ripples, they look very, very consistent. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure, like maybe that's the stepper motors. Like he, maybe each one of those little bumps represents a single step in the stepper motors, it's possible. You can see at the end when it, when it stops how uh, you get like a little uh, porosity pocket uh, that looks similar to like when you're when you're doing a weld and you're you don't get enough gas and you, know, you back it off really too quick looks like you get a little pocket there with wood I bet what you could do is use the like purposely blurred out to to give you some good results especially with engraving like if you're trying to get like a smooth gradients and stuff it probably would be better to like I haven't tried it but I have a feeling like if you purposely blur it out by, you know, defocusing the laser beam, you could get like nice smooth gradients on, on stuff like wood, possibly even stainless steel. But stainless steel looks like you really need to have like a high amount of power to get that done. Yeah. So this machine was sent to me from Creality, and like it, they just gave me everything. So, um, like the machine by default, it doesn't come with the honeycomb, the enclosure or this guy here, the uh, the rollers. They did have the other laser cutter, and uh, but like the main thing on this one is, the other one was 10 watts and this one is basically double that. So if we look at the scale here, 100%, so the other one could go up to 50%, so this column right here. And then this one here, it does 2,500 meters a minute. And that one's probably really good for easier to burn materials like felt and paper and stuff, because like you can really blast through cutting paper and stuff at those speeds. I'm gonna make a, another few videos of this machine because I want to try out all the things and yeah, and also like if, if you guys have any ideas of things I could try, like this video is you know it's unboxing and trying out stuff like you know this is pretty cool but I think this is way cooler at least for me this is this is like on stainless steel this is awesome um, yeah that's you know this is basswood I have uh, on another video I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna use plywood and I'm gonna cut like some some stuff in plywood and and build something kind of interesting so stay tuned for that one I ran the trial version of Lightburn to, to run this kind of stuff I think Lightburn like I'm I'm running the you know it's gonna last for 30 days but I'm gonna buy it after that uh, probably even sooner but like being able to just produce charts like this on various materials and just figure out like what intensity and what speeds run like this is really useful. So if you're going to get one of these machines, I would totally get one of these enclosures because like this enclosure, like it protects you from all the smoke and, and all that. And, and then also like the laser, you know, reflected rays off of this thing. I would still wear glasses with this thing closed, but like it'll keep you a lot safer. This is really good. Like if you're in a condo and you know, you can put this thing by a window and then vent out, uh, out the window. Like, yeah, that's, that's a no brainer for that. I'm trying to figure out what I should do with uh, this uh, rotary table. So like I have like this stainless steel cup, so like this could be an option. Problem is the uh, the uh, holder here. Problem is the handle here kind of gets in the way, so you can only really do so much. If I turn it this way, like I could do there, and then you know that just just the top of that, so not a lot. So yeah, keep that in mind if you're if you're doing anything round and with this. It's better off you're better off uh, doing something that has nothing on it like a stainless steel water bottle and then you can go all the way around and then with that uh, added uh, thing on the top like if your your bottle is you know has a skinny neck on it then you know that's no problem there it won't like kind of wobble around on you. So I'm gonna wrap this video up and I have uh, plans for the next one with this machine involving some cutting of plywood and, and all that and that'll be, I think it's going to be a lot more interesting than this. This is all like kind of just testing on materials and stuff. Like that's, you know, very generic, you see. But like even this, like I'm really impressed with, you know, just being able to mark thin steel. Let me know if you guys have any ideas of things you want me to try on this. All right, that's it for now, and I'll see you guys next time.